good afternoon to uh, to everyone and i would like to uh, start this afternoon session of the conference Figo uh, phenomenology and uh, digital knowledge with uh, our guests Comarin Romden Romluk and Carmelo Cagui. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, Comarin, who is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Sheffield. She's uh, specialized in uh, phenomenology and the feminist philosophy, especially in the thought of Merleau-Ponty and more recently, Frantz Fanon. Among her publications, I would like to mention the article Merleau-Ponty, Perception and Methodology, published this year with the uh, Oxford University Press and the edited collection, The Philosophies of Merleau-Ponty and Wittgenstein, published with Blowledge in 2017. Then, okay, I will give you the word and then I will introduce uh, Carmelo. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, thanks very much for your invitation to take part in this um, conference. Um, so I'm going to try now to share my screen um, so I can show you my slides. Okay, hopefully yeah, everyone can see that. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about um, a project which um, I carried out with some colleagues in Sheffield last semester. Um, it's not finished. I think it's really just at the beginning stages of the project, but I hope that um, this might be of interest to people. Um, and the project is called The Video Gaze. And um, my colleagues who I did this work with were Tom Stafford, who is uh, an, a lecturer, a senior lecturer in psychology at Sheffield, and Tamara Damjanovic and Levente Babskin, who are students in the psychology department. So, as we will all know, the pandemic has brought about a huge increase in online meetings and um, in particular, um, or most relevantly to people working in academia, perhaps all of our teaching and our work meetings and our training seminars and so on has moved online. Um, people have experienced widespread frustration as university teachers. Um, or at least, you know, people I've spoken to have been widely frustrated by students' reluctance to turn on cameras during online learning sessions, and particularly in sessions which are supposed to be discussion sessions, so um, seminars, tutorials, um, workshops, and so on. And then there's also been a number of anecdotal reports in magazines and on internet sites um, talking about how video um, calls of this of this nature that have happened so much during the pandemic um, have negatively impacted on some people's body image. So this has been raised as a problem for people, for example, who have eating disorders. So it seems as um, based on this kind of initial these initial observations that being visible online in a video call is different from being visible face to face. And I guess that seems obvious it's it is very different for me now <laughs> the experience of people watching me um than it would be if I, I was in person in a room with all of you um but it's i thought it would be interesting to try and think about why it's different and try to um, map out some of the parameters of difference and that's what this project was interested in now as as people who know phenomenology um, will already be aware in phenomenology there's a um, sort of important line of thought which connects the experience of visibility with trans transformation of the self. And there are various different theories um, around that general, very broad theme. So you find some authors arguing that the experience of visibility is connected with the development of things like self-consciousness, intersubjectivity, social identity, and in quite a lot of the thinkers who make that connection, you also find a connection between the gaze of other people on oneself and the experience of shame. So for some people, shame is central to visibility. And as people seemingly feel uncomfortable under what I'm calling the online gaze, which I'm sure is obvious what that means, but being seen online through a video link. Um, so we thought that a sort of interesting starting point 
would be to explore the experience of online visibility through the lens of shame. So that's what we set out to do. And um, we, our sort of guiding question, in other words, was does interacting online over a video link lead to higher levels of shame associated with one's visible self? And what I'm going to do in this um, talk is um, I'm going to briefly set out some of the background from some key phenomenologists who talk about um, visibility and shame and transformation of the self. Um, I'm sure lots of this will be familiar to people, but it seems worth just explaining some of this for people who aren't familiar and also to give you some sense of the kind of theoretical underpinnings of the project. Um, I'll then briefly talk about existing measures of shame that are found in the um, literature, and this is largely the empirical psycholo psychological literature, um, and I'll then briefly describe the study, which is really just a, a very early pilot that we carried out and the results such as they are that we, we got, and then um, briefly indicate further directions that we, we're thinking of going in and then see what suggestions or comments or questions anyone has. So starting off with some backgrounds then, the idea of the gaze is often understood as rooted in the Hegelian notion of recognition. That's not completely uncontroversial, not everybody agrees with that, but I think you can trace this line of heritage um, and I'm not going to try and give um, an, an overview of Hegel's ideas of recognition here um, because I'm not 100% sure that I fully understand it. And in any case, it would take ages for me to try and explain what I think is going on there. Um, but in Hegel, as um, many of you will know, I'm sure, recognition of the self by the other transforms consciousness into self-consciousness. And then, as I say, we, um, I think you can trace this idea, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who thinks this, um, into the work of people like Sartre, de Beauvoir, Fanon, Miller-Ponty and others. Um, they, they were directly influenced by, um, the, uh, his name's completely gone out of my head, it might come back to me, oh, Kojeb's readings of Hegel that were presented in Paris at the time that um, these people were working, and we know that some of them were at his lectures. Um, so it looks like the idea of the gaze that you find in the work of these authors um, is a sort of development of Hegel's ideas to do with recognition. Now, it might seem a little bit strange that I've included Merleau-Ponty amongst those people because the gaze and the idea of shame, the connection between gaze and shame, isn't a central idea for him, I don't think. And in fact, when he's discussing Sartre's ideas of, to do with the gaze in the phenomenology of perception, he kind of says, well, Sartre has observed a real phenomenon. It's true that sometimes one feels shame under the gaze of somebody else, but he disagrees with Sartre's analysis. Um, and he's, he's, he says that um, the, one only feels shame under the gaze of another um, because it takes the place of possible communication. So it doesn't have the centrality for him that it does in the work of other authors. Nevertheless, you do find this connection in Meloponti between my visibility in the eye of the other and transformation of the self. He still places importance on that connection um, because under the, the gaze of another, I gain the sense of having an outside and it also decenters my experience of the world. Because for Meloponti, I experience the world in terms of solicitations. I experience the world as inviting me to act. And the invitations for actions that I experience um, kind of tell me whereabouts I am in the world and what kinds of possibilities for action I have. So I see the table as inviting me to put a drink on it. And that then is tied up with my experience of myself as being the kind of being that could put a drink on the table. I have an arm and a cup and so on. And also my sense of the world is laid out in space around me. But when I see another person, I see them as a locus for action and I see the world as soliciting them to act. So it decenters my experience. I'm no longer the, the sole center of the world um, from which everything kind of um, spans out. There are these other centers. So you still find this connection between visibility and transformation of the self. Um, Sartre is probably most famously associated with the idea of the gaze and you have this um, sort of very um, paradigmatic example in Sartre of a peeping Tom who's caught spying through a keyhole. Um, the person becomes aware of being seen by another and feels shame. And the experience of shame for Sati analyzes as being simultaneous awareness of the other person as a subject 
someone who can perceive the self, make judgments about the self, so, etc. And oneself as an object, something that can be seen and um, thought about. And also um, this curtailing of one's own freedom. And very roughly the idea is something along the lines of um, the other sees me as a certain kind of person. So it, it gives me a sort of nature, which as a pure subjectivity, I don't have. According to Sartre, I have this um, pure freedom. But when the other sees me, they see me as being the sort of person who looks through, through keyholes and it makes me more object-like. Um, obviously that's very brief, but that's roughly the idea. Now, this example, um, it illustrates quite vividly the experience of feeling shame under the gaze of somebody else. But it's perhaps a little bit misleading because um, Sat seemingly wasn't just interested in cases where I feel shame because I'm doing something that other people see me as, um, you know, I'm doing something wrong, basically. And authors such as Dalazal have um, argued that we can dis differentiate three different levels of shame in Sartre's analysis. There's a moral emotion. So the experience of others' judgment that I've transgressed some social or moral norm. Um, an experience of self-evaluation. So an experience of shame, even when there's nobody else around because I'm judging myself to have transgressed in some way. But there's also what is perhaps to me more interesting. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's just you know, a reflection on my particular interest, but there's something that Dolezal calls pure shame, which she describes as an experience of bodily vulnerability and neediness in the face of the other. So this doesn't seem to be to do with shame as tied up with transgression in some way. Um, uh, it's instead a kind of awareness of the, of the human condition, the basic human condition of vulnerability. So I think it's quite interesting that she talks about that as a kind of shame. And then she reads Sart as being concerned with um, this. So you don't need to have been doing anything wrong at all, or even to feel that others are judging you to have done something wrong, or that you judge yourself to have done something wrong, to feel shame under the gaze of the other. Because there's this kind of much more basic, fundamental experience of vulnerability, which is somehow shameful. Now, in Sart's work, the gaze can be reversed. So there's this idea that, um, you know, I'm looked at by someone and I feel shame under their gaze, but equally I can look back and sort of reverse, in some sense, this relation between the person who looks as the subject and the person who is looked at as the object. And as, as is, um, you know, well known in Sart, um, they, they ends up with a, a power struggle to be the one who is the, the, the gazer, the, the subject who looks and the one who is the person looked at. Now in the work of Fanon and de Beauvoir, and I'm going to focus on Fanon purely because I'm writing about his work at the moment, um, but I think they have similar analyses, although talking about different um, social um, experiences. And according to Lewis Gordon, Fanon was influenced by Simone de Beauvoir and never was really honest about how much he was influenced by her. Um, and then both of them were apparently influenced by Richard Wright. But anyway, I, I shall just focus on Fanon because I want to give a, a, just a brief indication of a, a different line of thought here. So in Sartre, the gaze can be reversed, but for Fanon, uneven relations of power between people in the real world means that the gaze is not so easily reversed for some people. Uh, and of course, for Fanon, he's interested in race, not race per se, but race in um, a context of colonialism. Um, so he's interested in the way that um, black persons in the colonial system, and I'll probably just say white and black as a shorthand for that, but read it as under the system of colonialism. Um, the, the unevenness of power between white and blacks means that the, the black person cannot look back at the white person in the same way. You can't get this reversal that you find in Sart. Um, and in Fanon, you find the idea that racial identities are constituted by society. And the gaze is an important mechanism by which that happens. So um, very, very briefly, Fanon draws on Meloponti's idea of the body schema to explain, partly explain this. The body schema is very roughly the body's grasp of itself. And I have grasp in inverted commas because it's not cognitive. 
Um, it's not really perceptual either, but then it's hard to find a word to really capture what I'm talking about. Um, but we can see it as uh, having two broad components. There's a stable sense of oneself as an enduring being of a certain sort. And then there's a continuously changing sense of one's um, posture and configuration of one's limbs as one moves around the world. And there's an interplay between those things because your ongoing experience of your bodily self helps contribute to your stable sense of what kind of being you are. But what kind of being you are also plays a role in structuring the um, moment to moment experiences as you go around the world. And it's part of Merleau-Ponty's accounts that the body grasps itself in terms of its possibilities for action. So I know what kind of thing I am in this non-cognitive implicit sense of no that is associated with the body schema um, in terms of my abilities to play football, to um, grasp things with my left hand, my right hand, and so on and so on. Now Fanon adds to this the ideas of the historical racial schema and the epidermal racial schema. And his thought is that colonial thinking affects the colonized person's sense of their own body. So some of the possibilities for action um, that we are aware of ourselves as um, you know, possessing, um, these possibilities for action are built up in interactions with the world. And our interactions with the world include our interactions with other people and various social norms in our context. And some of the norms in a colonial society are racist. So they affect the possibilities for action that a person um, feels um, belong to them. So an example would be um, under apartheid, where physical space is divided into racialized zones, then that affects your um, sense of whether it's possible for you to, to go into one place or not. Um, it also um, affects under the, the sort of the colonial system, emotional attitudes that one has towards one's body and has this strange effect for the black person in the colonial system where they feel or have a sense of their own body as both hyper visible. So as standing out um, and, and being spotlighted in some way in, in this visible world and also invisible. And um, the invisibility there seems to be to do with um, not showing up for others as the particular individual that one is, but instead showing up as a kind of exemplar of a social, a social category. And then some people have argued as well that in Fanon, the, um, the important affective state that's associated with the gaze is not actually shame because everybody is supposed to feel shame under the gaze of another, it's universal. Whereas the kinds of things that he's talking about are specific to people of certain social groups. So Shiloh Whitney, for example, has argued that the, the, um, the most important affective state for Fanon associated with the gaze is horror. So horror about one's body under the gaze of another. So, some quick backgrounds of phenomenological thinking about visibility, the affective states associated with visibility, and the way that the self is transformed through visibility to the other. Next, I'm going to say a few quick words about the way that shame is measured in the literature. Because remember, what I'm interested in is trying to measure shame and online visibility to try and um, work out the ways in which online visibility is different in a sort of deeper phenomenological sense from just face-to-face -face visibility. Um, our strategy was to begin um, with this little project using a questionnaire to investigate experiences of shame associated with online visibility. There are, of course, um, limitations with using questionnaires because we're looking for self-reports and people's self-reports might not be honest or they might not be accurate for a number of different reasons, but it was a starting point. Um, and in the literature, as I say, there already exists several different scales for measuring shame using questionnaires. Now, those different scales um, employ different conceptions of shame and also different dimensions of shame are measured by them. Um, so I won't try to even give you any kind of overview here because that would take too long and it would be impossible, but just to give you a bit of an indication of what the literature contains already, a distinction that's often made in measurements of shame is um, between three different sources of shame, characterological shame, so shame about one's personal habits, one's manners with others, the sort of person one is, one's abilities, behavioural shame, 
which is a more, uh, the way I understood it, like a more sort of momentary shame or shame that attaches to something that's not so um, widespread or so broad. If, if I'm ashamed about my habit of smoking, for example, that's a kind of long standing feature of myself. I could, of course, change it. Um, so it's not permanent, but nevertheless, it's shame about something that is is more sort of, um, you know, ongoing, whereas behavioral shame is about something that's more um, temporary. So doing something wrong, saying something stupid, those kinds of things. And then there's also bodily shame. But bodily shame in the existing literature tends to be shame that's understood um, to do with feeling ashamed of one's body or part of it in the sense of your body doesn't measure up to some measure of what a body should measure up to. It's not, at least as far as I've been able to see, um, connected with this kind of fundamental shame at the human condition and vulnerability that um, I mentioned earlier. Another commonly made distinction in the literature uh, amongst people who try to measure shame empirically is between external shame, so experience of oneself as seen and judged by others, and the internal shame, which is the experience of the self as seen and judged by the self. And we also find um, in many of the measures of shame that exist, four core domains of the experience of shame. So inferiority or inadequacy, a sense of isolation or exclusion, um, the experience of uselessness or emptiness, and then um, the experience of criticism or judgment. So, Shame seems to be this very sort of wide ranging um, kind of umbrella term really for a bunch of different things. And the literature on shame is measuring like various things that fall under this general umbrella. It's unclear, um, it was unclear to us thinking about our little project, how much the measurements and conceptions of shame in the existing literature map onto the phenomenological ideas to do with shame that we're interested in. Haven't particularly investigated that in detail yet. Be interested to hear any thoughts that people have on this. So what did we do? Well, as there were so many different um, shame scales available in the literature and none of them quite fit what we were interested in, um, we used some of the ideas from those to develop um, a series of questions that was targeting the demographic that we thought we'd start with investigating, which was university students who've been learning online in the, in the recent pandemic. Um, and then we asked them a series of questions which were trying to get at some of the ideas that we were interested in, as I say, some based on existing shame measurements and some that we'd kind of made up after um, some initial talking to to people and so on. And I, I won't go through all those questions in loads of detail, but I will just briefly now explain, um, outline some of the things that we asked before telling you what results we gathered. Um, so we, we began with asking some demographic info. As I say, we initially concentrated on university students. So that again is a limitation because their experience might be very, very different from the experience of another group of people. Um, we're aware of that, but that's where we started. And then we ask them how much they have their cameras on in an interactive session. So to get a sense of how much experience of being visible online they have, because I had students who just didn't turn their cameras on ever. So if I was asking them questions about online visibility, I might not get some very good questions, but any um, answers. But anyway, we asked them that. And then we asked them to wait a series of possible reasons for not turning on their cameras. Um, we gave them the opportunity to describe any other reasons why they might not turn on their cameras. Um, we then wondered to what extent um, their turning their cameras on depended on other people in the room. So we were thinking about the idea of reciprocal visibility, obviously, there. So we asked them about that. And then we asked them whether they preferred being able to see other people in an online discussion teaching session. We also asked them a series of um, appearance monitoring questions. So we asked them when they were um, in an online seminar, whether they found themselves doing things like checking their hair, rearranging their hair, um, altering their facial expressions, um, so monitoring their appearance in various ways and how often they estimated that they found themselves doing those things. We asked them what they normally paid attention to out of themselves, other students, the professor and so on. 
And then we asked them a series of questions about worries they might have about their appearance online, such as whether they thought they looked different online to in real life and whether that concerned them, those kinds of things. And then we asked them some questions about um, their environment, because one of the reasons why some people anecdotally, when we first talked to students, just um, you know, having chats before we developed the questions, one thing that came up was that, of course, some students are having to do their online learning in strange places because they don't have a spare room, they don't have um, a desk that they can sit at at home with Wi-Fi, and maybe actually they're not feeling shame about their bodily appearance, but they're feeling shame about their environment. So we asked them a question to see how much of that was going on. And we asked them about, um, to get at that, what other, what other things, aside from their self, do they allow to be in the video screen? So um, do they allow um, photographs of their friends and family to be on show, for example? And then we ended by asking them a series of discursive questions, just reflecting on online learning in general to see what came out of that. Now, the results, such as they are, um, I'm not sure that we really managed to find out much about the sorts of things that we were interested in. Um, but I, I again, I won't go over all our results with you because there are too many and it would take too long. So I've just picked out a few things that I thought were um, interesting. Um, and then, as I say, I'll, be, I'll finish shortly by indicating future directions that we might take this project in. So just under 50% agreed or slightly agreed that they found themselves rearranging their hair. And 50% also agreed or slightly agreed that they, find their, them, they found themselves altering their facial expressions during online um, seminars. Around 60% of them checked their camera several times to make sure when they thought it was turned off, that it really was turned off. So they couldn't accidentally be seen when they thought that they weren't being seen. And under 50% of, just under 50% agreed that they were worried that other people might be watching them without them knowing that they were being watched. So one of the things that's obviously strange about an online um, interaction is that in, in the flesh, I can see if you're looking at me, but right now I have got no idea who's actually looking at me or not. And some of them found that uncomfortable and 40% of them worried that their camera might have accidentally become switched on. Um, there were worries basically over the lack of reciprocity, which maybe seems obvious, but being seen without being able to tell that others are looking. So that kind of panopticon, I guess, panopticon experience. People also talked in the discursive sections of the questionnaire about difficulties with being able to read the room. So the discomfort of not being able to look round at other people and see how they are reacting to oneself um, and, and that being part of the discomfort of being visible online. Um, several people talked about the discomfort of being singled out as visible online in some way or other. So there seems to be something to do with the experience of being hyper visible online as compared to in the flesh. And then people talked in various ways about the experience of online seminars involving self-monitoring and sort of disciplining of the appearance. And then finally, a sort of it's unrelated perhaps to the experience of visibility, but it still seems kind of interesting. Several of them talked about the importance of one's environment to um, being able to focus. And um, again, it seems kind of obvious, but um, that transition of phys the physical transition of going into a seminar room and the importance that plays in um, situating people in, not just in a physical, locating them in a physical place, but situating them in um, you know, a setting for action, um, a setting for activity and how that was missing with a sort of online experience. So finally then, and very quickly, just to, in conclusion, next steps with the project. As I say, it wasn't very clear how much interesting data was generated by our questionnaires. Um, really, I think what would be good to follow up with is some kind of semi-structured interviews to try and dig a bit deeper into the experience of being visible online. Um, we also wondered about thinking about online visibility in relation to a phenomenon that some people have started to investigate phenomenologically, which is the phenomenon of the locked down body. So you may have come across this, um, Havy Carell's written something about this recently, but the ways in which lockdown has disrupted 
um, what's sometimes called co-embodiment, um, you know, all the sorts of ways that we normally are bodily related to each other. So I guess things like the kind of micro pauses in conversation, the mirroring, mirroring of each other's um, bodily gestures, which kind of underpin conversation and enable it to happen. Um, so people have talked about those differences in locked down bodiliness. And I wondered whether some of that could be um, usefully thought about in relation to experiences of online visibility. And then also the contrasts between online visibility, telepresence and virtual embodiment. And these all seem to be slightly different things, I think. So there's some phenomenological work on telepresence. So that's things like, for example, where um, a surgeon is using um, video equipment to allow her to see inside somebody else's body. Um, so that there's, um, yeah, using um, technology to kind of put yourself in a different environment. Um, and then virtual embodiment is embodiment in avatars. So these are all different from being visible online in a video link, but they also seem to share some interesting similarities. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to look at the contrast there. And then finally, just sort of much more general questions about how to capture perhaps more accurately or with more, um, you know, more differentiation, the effective dimensions of visibility. So um, the idea that shame is maybe too broad a category and what other sort of um, interesting things we might be able to discover about that. Okay, um, I shall stop there. Stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Komarin. Now I, I would say a couple of words about uh, Carmelo Cagui, who is uh, Associate Professor of Aesthetics at the University of Palermo, where, he's also, where he also directs the Medical Humanities Lab. He studies uh, phenomenology, cognitive sciences, psychology of perception, philosophy of mind, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Among his publications, I would like to mention his book, Phenomenology of Perception, Theories and Experimental Evidence, published by Brig in 2017. This is a book that I liked very, very much. So I wanted to mention it. So please, Carmelo. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, your invitation, and the organization of this beautiful conference. I now going to share my slide. The topic of my um, the topic of my discussion, my talk, will be phenomenology as the study of perception for biological and artificial agents and environments. In this talk, I am going to focus to, um, on uh, um, an, an instance of an architecture uh, for a neural digital network and a robotic device. But I think that my arguments can be extended uh, to artificial artificial agents and environments that can also be computer generated or supplemented with digital interface and systems. The points at issues are what does phenomenology imply for studying perception? How is it embedded in philosophical and scientific theories of perceptions? What are the demands of phenomenology for artificial agents and environments? And finally, is synthetic phenomenology a sound research program? Uh, to answer the first question, uh, I claim that phenomenology is as abstract as any theory or science is, since it builds its own conceptual and experimental structure to capture the properties and the relations of its domain. The aim of building this structure is making the sense of perception explicit, that is to provide the conceptual analysis of the experimental evidence of the form of perception that enables perceivers to fix a reference under a perceptual modality and understand it through its modes of appearing. Um, by form, I mean uh, um, a collection of rules that make up a sort of grammar uh, that underlies a cognitive capability. Uh, this structure 
must not include concepts of not ordinary objects, like for instance, qualia, constructs uh, or evidence uh, uh, derived from other sciences like physics or neuroscience, but also it must not include common sense beliefs, like for instance, uh, that the appearances of X are due to the material properties of X or that they are only subjective semins. Therefore, the domain uh, which is correlated to this structure consists of the intrinsic properties of appearances. But what does intrinsic mean? To clarify this meaning, uh, I surmise that phenomenology is a study of perception from within, like intrinsic geometry is the science of surfaces independently of the space they are embedded in. Indeed, perception is a mode of cognition that can be studied from an extrinsic standpoint. And in this case, the object of study, the objects of study are the properties of the information about external reference, uh, for instance, accuracy, in connection with other sciences too, such as the physics of material things and substances, uh, the physics of the information, uh, neurobiology, but perception can be also studied from an intrinsic standpoint. And in this case, the object of study is the form of perception that endows appearances with the rules and the order that allow them to convey information. Uh, from the intrinsic standpoint, the reference is set to zero, so to say. It is true to experience to say that external things are that without which perception is necessarily unsaturated, but they are considered as mind-independent objects only within the limits of perception. Uh, this point uh, can be easily traced back to at least Brentano, Herring, and Husserl. The information one gets by the acquaintance with things is replaced with the properties of the appearances that convey it. And appearances are treated as, as something taking place outside of perceivers. To sum up this point, I quote Bozzi, the perceivable thing is the logical sum of the possible configurations given the arrangement of its observable elements. Another qualifying characteristics of phenomenology uh, was made clear by Dunker. Uh, Dunker claimed that from the intrinsic standpoint, the phenomenological science of perception is not interested in first person data as such, rather in the order of properties of appearances on whose grounds no appearance can differ arbitrarily across subjects, and a difference in one dimension of appearances across subjects must occur with a consistent difference in the connected dimensions. Uh, for instance, in the first case, let's assume that A, B, and C appear to A uh, as holding the relation of being greater than, while they appear to B as holding the relation of being the immediate neighbor of. Therefore, the inequality between A and C cannot appear to B while it appears to A. For the second case, let's assume that A is a subject who sees according an inversion of the black-white series of color after wearing some spectacles. Then A should see also a consistent inversion of the lightness-darkness series, and so should B. On the basis of such arguments, Dunker concludes that uh, first-person experiences play for phenomenology the same roles as drawn figures do for geometry, because one accounts for perception only when one discovers the invariance of all the properties of appearances across conditions, so that first-person data can be treated as much an interpretation of the ordered system of appearances as entities like point, line, surface are interpretation of geometrical axioms. Furthermore, subjective differences due to physiological causes 
matter as transformation of the other properties. For instance, for color blind sight cases, one should search for what equality of appearances are preserved and what inequalities instead occur. An example is Rubin's conceptual experimental analysis of figure ground structure. Rubin manipulates observable factors that induce changes of segregation, stratification, completion, and attribution of properties for figure ground inversion. To show that this phenomenon is not due to a mental content added to a sensory one or to attention, Rubin employs variables and terms that do not refer to things of ordinary world. However, he claims that the evidence and the design of the experimental condition must not be simpler than that required by ordinary world, because without this structure, edges could not delimit shapes of things, and surrounding movement and colors change would alter, would alter the shape of things. I, earlier, I have mentioned an abstract structure of the theory. Um, we can say that this structure consists of primitives like boundary, surface, continuum, basic relations, like for instance, dependence, part whole relation, belongingness, betweenness, connections, and operation, unification versus segregation through grouping, motions, or transformation with their own coordinate systems and variation. But this structure consists also of experimental paradigms, such as Vertimer's device to manipulate time intervals to obtain different kinds of motion, Kohler's setting to study animal problem solving, Metzger's Gansfeld, Michaud's concomitant variation and conflictive systems of stimulation. All such constructs are defined as terms or predicates, or predicates or are designed as variables whose meaning can be directly or indirectly traced to observable qualities and magnitude, because the aim is to carry out a decomposition of perception through conceptual analysis and experimental manipulation. Now, I try to answer the second question, how is phenomenology embedded in philosophical or scientific theories of perception? In a philosophical theory of perception, terms and predicates are defined to build propositions that describe phenomena. But phenomena are introduced as conceptual placeholders for the array of repeatable properties and connections of appearances, which can be even disjointly instanced in any perceptual scene. Admitted operations are applied on proposition to obtain the descriptions of the parts and the properties of phenomena and the combination thereof that account for the meaning and reference in single perceptions of something. The truth value of description is preserved if naive subject's perception is a valid interpretation of the propositions in the sense that appearances they have should change uh, in that their meaning on their reference would be altered or lacking to satisfy different descriptions. Here it is some examples of phenomenological philosophy of perception. Uh, Brentano's theory of qualitative continuum and phenomenal magnitudes, Minong's description of the abstract solid that represent the perception of colors, Stumpf's theory of attributive parts of space and tones, and his consideration on the algebraic geometrical relations that account for equivalence and order of appearances, Husserl's theory of the spatial structures of visual fields and the coordinate systems of movements. In a scientific theory of perception, appearances are replaced with phenomenal variables that make them testable and observable in a controlled condition. This point was made clear by Kafka. This conceptual substitution with phenomenal data fulfills an explanatory function. The reactions of subjects to the environment are decomposed 
under the respect of perception into the parts and connection of appearances. And on the basis of the evidence drawn from the experimental manipulation of such phenomenal data, one can describe the rules and the order by which a particular kind of appearances make the world accessible under a perceptual module. Uh, the term module, of, uh, of course, is mine. Um, by good help, a list of examples of phenomenological experimental research will be hugely rich. To limit the view to its outstanding historical sources, we may refer to psychologists who have worked on many building blocks of the perceivable world. Uh, here it is, a short list. Um, now I will try to set out the demands of phenomenology for artificial agents and environments that come from AI and robotics and have been collected under the heading of synthetic phenomenology. The term synthetic phenomenology was introduced by Scott Jordan in 1998 on the basis of an analogy as synthetic biology combines science and engineering to construct new biological functions and systems that are not found in nature, so synthetic phenomenology aims at modeling, designing, and developing conscious systems, including their states and functions, on artificial hardware. Synthetic phenomenology emerges from the field that is called artificial consciousness. Gametz uh, defines this field as the determination whether artificial agents can be endowed with or are capable of phenomenal consciousness, intended as the capability to have and experience a hub. The assumption is that this capability is crucial for them to solve satisfyingly the problems that arise from coping efficiently with their environment. So, to pick up what is salient and detect relevant changes, to retain and anticipate perceptions at distinct temporal scales and accordingly adapt to one's behavior. Uh, this cartoon uh, that is drawn from Pilishin uh, shows uh, um, what such problems look like. The rover needs to find the path to navigate its environment. Uh, in order to enable the rover to solve this problem in a satisfying way, um, is it sufficient um, to endow it uh, with the representational capability and to restrict the domain of the uh, design problems um, to the format uh, of such representations, or do we need to address the questions of artificial consciousness? However, synthetic phenomenology is characterized further by the aim to describe the phenomenal content, that is, the specification of what confers intentional semantic and referential properties on agents' experiences experiencing, sorry, or having appearances of something. Crisley distinguished between two lines of research, although they are not mutually exclusive. The type one synthetic phenomenology is the specification of the phenomenal content embedded in artificial agents. The type two synthetic phenomenology is the use of artificial agents as models of the phenomenal content so that the specification is canonically related to their experience and it can be communicated to and scrutinized by designers of cognitive systems. Um, the axiomatic consciousness theory and its implementation in the so-called kernel architecture by Alexander is a kind of research that straddles the types one and two. The implementation of this theory in a digital net architecture is characterized by indexing perceptual representations to the coordinates of the motions of the agent's mobile sensors and effectors, 
for instance, eye movements and actions, allowing thus for the feeling of being present in an out there world to emerge so that the first person experience can be ascribed to the agent, making explicit what the world and the system seem like from its point of view, so that it is possible a third person assessment of the phenomenal states. Let's have a look to uh, a schematic representation of this architecture. Um, the architecture dictates that the neural network, uh, which is uh, um, in fact a digital neural network, is composed um, by uh, neurons and connections of neurons um, that are uh, contained in modules. Uh, a module is a functionally distinct unit. Each module can be connected to the others. Uh, let's, uh, let's briefly see uh, uh, what these modules are. Uh, the perceptual module yields views of the self and the world to which the feeling of selection, focus, and shift to what is salient through attention is associated. The action module controls the variables of the perceptual modules by, in other terms, what the agent senses by indexing each view to movement coordinates. This indexing underlies properties binding and selects what becomes a phenomenal state as a couple of a perceptual properties and an actual possibility. Uh, the memory module retrieves the phenomenal states and processes them in sequences through uh, something like imagery. It may enter the perceptual module to supplement it even in the, abs in the absence of uh, a sensory input. Finally, the emotion module gives outcome of perception and action an effective value. To see how it works, um, um, let's have a look to this picture. This picture represents a, a, a section of the visual fields with an overlying grid that selects the region or the area of the, the the visual field uh, that is actually inspected visually by the agent. The three by three matrices in B represent the perceptual module inspections of part of A through eye motions only, which are carried out along the directions of the arrows. Each cell at the center of the matrix are indexed by the action module with a note, while the other surrounding cell for each matrix are indexed with, by positive or negative values according to the arrows. As eyes move, uh, the memory module learn the phenomenal states and supplements the perceptual module with image states that are predictable on the basis of motion trajectories. This indexation of the perceptual module by the action module for each input and the exploration of possible states by the memory module are repeated at different scales. Thus, they build spaces that are correlated to different movements. First of all, we have the eye field space that is built out of local foveal field views. Uh, obtained through eye movements without head movement. Then we have the in front of visual field that is built out of eye fields through head and torso movement without locomotion. Finally, we have the surrounding space that is built out of in front of visual fields through locomotion and the knowledge of what is behind the agent that is, that is obtained through actions like turning around and the memory feedback. 
The work of Crisley and Padmore is an instance of type two uh, synthetic phenomenology. On the basis of the sensory motor contingency theory, they implemented a program of basic visual abilities and expectation maintenance in the robot IBO ERS, ERS7 and developed a model, the CR3 model, to represent and communicate the phenomenal content of the robot's visual experience. To give you an idea of the robot, uh, which is used as a platform for the model, um, let allow me to introduce it with briefly uh, some videos. In this first video, you can see the robot. Here is is caught in one of his his uh, uh, standard behavior, that is uh, the recognition of an object while moving around his, its environment. In this second video, you can appreciate the high degree of time and coordination of the movements of the robots, uh, who is engaged in reproducing one of the most um, funny sketch of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> okay. Um, the CR3 model generates a dynamic temporally extended map of the phenomenal content of the robot. Uh, this is a picture uh, that was extracted by, uh, from this map um, and it covers what uh, Ibo sees and expects to see uh, in a definite time interval. Each circle represent a foveal field of view. At the center of the circle, it is depicted the foveal input at, at time t. In the surrounding area, it is depicted what Ibo expects to see for head motions away from the center. Overlapping circles are regions correlated by head movements. The area is greater the more the visual region is explored on the basis of what Ibo expects to see. The intensity of sensation or expectation on the basis of previous experience are color coded. Um, pink stands for the effective valuation. Its occurrence and intensity represents a negative stimulus, for instance, an excessively bright light. Since the CR3 represents the phenomenal content indexed to spatial locations, it provides third person observers with an isomorphic specification, that is, a depiction of what appears to the agent and where, given some movements, at least uh, such are the claims of the authors. Now, um, I try to give an answer to our last question. Is synthetic phenomenology a sound research program? Synthetic phenomenology addresses questions for artificial agents that are equivalent in many respects to those addressed by phenomenology of perception for human subjects. That may sound out, given our intuition of a biological basis, that is necessary for animals to be able to perceive. However, in both cases, we consider barriers of perceptual systems under the restriction of the study of the rules and orders of appearances that allow them having phenomenal access to their environment. 
Indeed, one can construe synthetic phenomenology as an expansion of Duncan's claim about the indifference of first person data as such. Then how can experimental phenomenology contribute to synthetic phenomenology? As regards the architecture design, there is phenomenological evidence of the independence of the perceptual module from the memory module. In his well-known researches on a modal completion or anomalous surfaces, Kanitza has shown that one can design operations that change some parts of the visual pattern, making, in this case, for instance, completion either appear or disappear, regardless of the interpolation of what it could have been looking like to someone on the grounds of not perceptual cognitive functions or attitudes. As regards the architecture design and the reference theory of sensory motor contingencies, the contribution may, conserve, may concern a disputable assumption. Body movements are not determinant factors of appearances. Since the visual field is an ordered system of positions that can be distinguished by appearances, and on the other hand, appearances are marked by positions, body movements are coordinated to transformations of the order of appearances onto itself, which are the determinant factor of perceptual meaning and reference. This point was made clear by Husserl and Metzger. Uh, for this reason, objects' movement can induce changes of the structures that, that are built up from, uh, by the relation between shape and position and size and distance, and such changes may bring about the stereokinetic depth phenomena, which were studied by Benussi and Musatti. As regards experimentation, experimental phenomenology may contribute to the design of test suites to identify what states of an agent become active and to specify for what features of the environment they do and to observe whether such states bring about a consistent behavior in response to a repeatable connections of connection of features. For instance, Parameters of space, time, and motion may be concomitantly varied arbitrarily along the values that the agent's sensors can take on, with a range within which the components of Michaud's kinetic structure may occur. That does not prejudice how the world should be looking like to the agent. However, one may submit that there will be subsets of states for distinct combination of values recorded by the sensors, among which a subset of stable states may occur for those kinetic structures uh, that underlie mechanical and perceivable causality or intentionality attribution. Finally, once the similarity or the difference of the behavior with that of other biological or artificial agents in the same conditions has been observed, one may use a model or a meta-language as a description of the phenomenal content of such states. Gaiman's suggested to use the XML. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carmelo, for your, for your talk which was very, very interesting, especially for me that I study um, experimental phenomenology. And uh, thank you again also to Komarin for her talk. Now, um, I would like uh, you to uh, talk to each other. Uh, Komarin, are you there? My internet connection is unstable, so I'm here, but I seem to keep freezing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so who wants to start asking questions to each other? I, I would like to ask Kamarin uh, something more uh, about uh, the methodology of the questionnaires that uh, they have administered uh, to the subjects uh, in their research. Yes, please, please do. 
Uh, okay. Uh, did you use uh, um, something like um, liquor scales uh, or um, or you um, or did you use um, constructs uh, that that you have drawn from the literature um, or uh, did you use constructs uh, that were tested by administering uh, some words items uh, to uh, some experts uh, before um, giving the question as to the subjects. So um, quite a lot of the questions used um, Likert scales and then um, some of them which were more discursive were using um, ideas from the literature and also some initial um, I don't quite know what you'd call them, but we had a few conversations with people in order to um, draw up the, um, to design the questionnaire. Um, my colleagues in psychology were much more heavily involved in that aspect of the, um, the work because it's not my expertise. Um, I was more involved in telling them about the phenomenological ideas. And then we did the literature re review together and then um, they sort of guided the, um, the, the, um, the design of the questions, but quite a lot of them were using um, Likert scales. Um, so yeah, that's part of the, the sort of methodological design. Thank you. Uh, from the standpoint of the phenomenological uh, uh, side of your research, um, do you think that um, the multi multidimensional nature of shame uh, needs to me to be mapped onto um, distinct uh, phenomenological dimension of experience? And uh, um, what is the relation between uh, such dimension? Is it an additive one, a multiplicative one? Um, can you, you, you tell me something more about that? Yeah, um, so that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think that although there's a lot of really good phenomenological work on shame, there's still an awful lot left to be done. And um, I, I mentioned in passing that one of the things that really intrigues me is this idea that um, there's, a, there's a kind of very basic experience of bodily vulnerability in the face of the other that presents as a sort of fundamental shame. And when Dolezal is discussing this and she sort of reads it in Sartre and she's not alone in doing that, she refers to other authors who also see that line of thinking in Sartre, but she connects it with some experimental data from very young children. Um, and I haven't looked into that in great detail yet, but I was really intrigued by it. And I was wondering about whether um, shame is really the sort of correct label for that um, so I'd, I'd like to see more work on that and then it, it feels like the sort of work um, from Fanon about the um, so the thing I mentioned about the affective state that's crucial under the white gaze being horror and um, I understand that he's drawing on Freudian ideas of horror there where the object of horror is supposed to be something that's both compulsive and um, sorry, that's the wrong word, that both compels and fascinates, sorry, repels and fascinates, repels and compels, um, and that being the most important um, affect that's associated with the white gaze. Um, that's um, not something that I've found particularly reflected so far in our investigations into the sort of um, empirical literature on shame. So it feels like there's a lot of work still to be done there in um, you know both trying to map a bit more clearly perhaps um, the different varieties of shame the different um, experiences that are related to shame but maybe shouldn't be called shame from a phenomenological perspective and then trying to map all of that onto or bring it into dialogue with the sort of more empirical work on shame that's been done um, so I've, yeah, I think there's work to be done there and it, it strikes me as being really interesting aside from questions of online visibility. I, I really found that interesting and I, I had questions. These, um, the first one, I guess, was 
to do with whether the kind of research program that you were describing um, under the heading of synthetic phenomenology um, has a sort of atomistic approach to perceptual experience, which I wondered if, 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 if that's true that it does. And if it does, that seems um, in conflict with ideas to, um, of whole, holism and uh, like Gestalt ideas, basically, that you find in the work of people like Monoponti and the earlier kind of Gestalt psychologists, some of whom you talked about a bit earlier. So I wondered if you could remark on that a little, please. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, uh, the, the point I try to make to emphasize is that um, the phenomenology of perception is uh, a sort of uh, autonomous theory uh, about the rules or the grammar, if you want, uh, underlying perception. And this theory uh, has been embedded in Gestalt psychology, but um, Gestalt psychology research and phenomenological theories are not the same. Um, so I think that um, the philosophical uh, use of Gestalt psychology research by Merleau-Ponty or uh, even some Gestalt psychologists uh, would, uh, would argue against uh, um, the, the research program of synthetic phenomenology. But um, I think that if we understand uh, phenomenology um, at its core, uh, that is uh, to study um, perception as uh, an independent mode of cognition uh, that satisfy something like a grammar. And the concept of grammar uh, comes from uh, uh, Brentano, uh, but it was inherited by Canitza, who was a Gestaltist, uh, an Italian Gestaltist, um, um, and wrote a, a very beautiful book on that. Um, if we um, concentrate on this call, um, there is no uh, principled reason um, to deny that phenomenological research can be used to specify uh, uh, how artificial agents uh, um, interact with their environment without being committed to say that they have uh, the same phenomenal experience we have. I don't know if I if I uh, succeed in in uh, in giving you an answer. Yes, thank you. Yes, um, can I, can I ask a, a, another question? It's um, yes, of course. It's maybe a, li a little similar. So you've maybe already answered it, but I I I'd like to know a little bit more. So at times when you were talking about the CA three program and the mapping of the sort of phenomenal content of the robot, which seemed really fascinating. It seemed a little bit like um, some of the, um, the mappings drawn from the architecture of the robot. But then again, in the work of people like Molo Ponti, you have this argument that you, you shouldn't, one shouldn't draw conclusions about phenomenal content from architecture, because the way in which the different components of the visual system interact mean that um, you don't quite know how it's gonna what's gonna happen as a result of these things coming together um, so I wondered again if that is another difference between um, the sort of research that you were talking about and Melo Ponti's approach I'm talking about him because I'm interested in his work so but yeah thank uh, no thank you uh, but um, I must confess that um, um, I consider, um, I think that Merleau-Ponty's philosophy was influenced by phenomenology, but um, um, it didn't uh, satisfy satisfied many of the features of what uh, a phenomenological study of perception means. Um, because uh, 
he didn't uh, didn't have uh, a role a part for uh, relation theory uh, um, he um, considered uh, that the content of visual experience uh, is uh, um, fully integrated by um, sensor the, the sensations of movements while this is something that phenomenology of perception has proved to be wrong. Um, that said, um, Merleau-Ponty in uh, his structures of behavior um, used uh, uh, made reference uh, to, to the, um, the research of uh, Gelb and Goldmeier um, uh, on the brain injured uh, subjects uh, that were coming back from the war. Uh, and he did emphasize that the, 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 the damage to the architecture of the brain could be, um, could give uh, some hints at how uh, things looks, look as they do. Uh, so um, the argument that uh, um, the architecture is connected to the phenomenal content uh, is not so strange even for him. Um, the, the point is that um, in such architectures like the kernel architecture, the connections between neurons are not decided uh, before the network works uh, by the designer. Um, they are, uh, so to say, a weightless connection. The connections uh, are being made while the net, uh, uh, the net is perceiving something. So I think that um, in this case, uh, we cannot say that our decisions about uh, how the network uh, is built um, and induce, uh, bring about some bias uh, on, the, on our research about uh, what perception uh, is. Now there is uh, Ivana Bianchi who would like to ask a question, so please. Thank you. Hi, I don't see anybody at this point. And uh, so first of all, I hope that you can at least uh, uh, hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you both, both very interesting and stimulating uh, um, talks. Uh, I, I have a question for actually maybe two suggestions or two prompts for Comarin. Um, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot see her face, so I cannot understand whether what I'm saying makes sense or not, but I hope so. Uh, I am a psychologist of uh, an experimental psychologist, and uh, I'm also an uh, uh, experimental phenomenologist. So um, I, I, I have an idea of the kind of project you are developing, and I think it's very interesting. And I admit that I'm also a bit surprised that there is nothing uh, relevant yet on this, because it really seems a, a, a very important point. So I'm happy that you bumped into it and that you will have uh, room enough to find interesting things. Um, my first observation is this. Maybe since you now are in this exploratory phase, it might be um, good to explore also whether there are relationships between uh, um, responses that participants give in terms of uh, feeling shame or not, and some of the most important personality traits. I'm thinking about the big five, 
which is the, the, the test that psychology uh, usually use uh, for testing personality, because there are two dimensions, two out of these bigs, big fives, that might be relevant. One is extroversion, uh, and the other is neuroticism. Uh, so for instance, to, to I, I don't know whether you are familiar with, but uh, some of the items that are used to test extroversion uh, are of this sort. I am the life of the party, or I took, I talked to a lot of different people at parties, or I do not mind to be the center of attention, or I keep in the background. So people have to give a, an answer to this, to, to rate uh, whether they agree or not with these uh, uh, statements. A and this captures a first idea of, um, extroversion, which is a relevant trait, and because I was thinking that maybe uh, feeling shame or not might also depend on some characteristics of the individuals that you are testing. The same for the other trait I was mentioning that is neuroticism. So it might be very simple to add some few of these items at the beginning so that you can then understand whether responses change based on the fact that the participants who are, are responding are high or low on these scales. These, on the one hand, might make you discover something new. On the other, scale, uh, on the other side, might help you to get rid of noise in the data. So this is the first thing. Um, sorry, I cannot see the face of Professor Comerin, so I, 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 I do not have a clue of whether I'm saying something that is meaningful or that they have already considered. Oh, no, thank you for that suggestion. That, that's, um, that's really helpful and interesting. Um, what, the, what we've added um, so far was um, demographic information about people's um, some aspects of social identity. Mm -hmm. So thinking about ideas of, you know, whether whether women feel shame or etc. Um, but we haven't added in data um, of um, the sort of key personality um, traits that you just suggested. So thank you. That's really interesting. OK. And if I may, another little thing is that I would really like to encourage her not to give up with uh, uh, your colleagues, a psychologist, which in this case should be more my colleagues, because I know that it is very difficult sometimes to, um, to, uh, to show them that we really need to change the categories with the constructs that we are, we are using to, uh, to investigate a certain domain. So, from what I understood from your talk, you have the idea that uh, there might be a lot coming out from the phenomenological categories of, of shame uh, that uh, phenomenologists have explored that m might be might enrich our way uh, of uh, addressing the research question from an experimental point of view. And I, I really think that uh, it's important sometimes to take time and to, to give space to this initial exploration. And I know that psychologists, of classical no, uh, psychologists often are quick in running into tools or ideas that psychologists have already developed. And, and so in this case, uh, Maybe the questionnaire needs to be revised a little bit, uh, but uh, I think it is a risk to fall immediately into the use of more, more consolidated uh, tests or ideas that psychologists already have because we will lose too much of, uh, of uh, phenomenology. So um, keep strong uh, on your phenomenological side, if, if, I, if I may. Thank you. <laughs> That's helpful advice. I'm lucky that, um, so Tom, who I mentioned, so the um, oh. professor in psychology that I've been working with, and it's two of his students. And I'm, I'm very lucky to know Tom because um, he's 
He's one of the few psychologists I've come across who's got time to talk to philosophers. <laughs> Everyone's so point. busy that, you know, they um, people might be interested, but they've just got to write the next grant application and so on. So, but no, thank you for that. That's that's really helpful. Okay, now I I will make my questions. I have a question for Komarin and a question for Carmel. First of all, I liked both your, your talks uh, because um, in both your cases, um, phenomenology is not only seen from the theoretical point of view, but also from the applied, the experimental point of view. And it's very important because phenomenology needs to be applied, okay? Needs to be applied to the, uh, to the life world, uh, to the uh, perceptual experiences, and uh, also to intersubjective uh, experience, just as the shame one. Uh, for what concerns uh, the question to uh, Komarin, I'd like to, um, I was very, very uh, positively astonished when I discovered that you were uh, studying also Franz Fanon, because I think uh, um, many, many people don't know him as a phenomenologist and, uh, and uh, trying to adopt uh, his perspective to study shame, I think it's a uh, it's a very good move, I appreciate. And uh, I'd like to ask you, um, now you are mm, starting also to collect the results, I saw, and then you have also to continue with your project. I wanted to ask you if you already found something in the phenomenon of shame in online um, interaction concerning um, ethnicity, uh, the color of the skin, and uh, maybe the bond between these factors and the social classes? Um, no, it's one of the things I'd be interested in looking into. Um, but uh, we're looking at university students and a lot of our students are white Caucasian people. Um, there's only a handful of um, students with black heritage who I've ever taught um, and I, I um, so there's, there's not enough people who are not white who've answered the, um, the, the questionnaire that we've asked for us to be able to um, to say any more about that and um, it's something that I'm definitely interested in um, you know investigating but at, at the moment we have we haven't um, the you mentioned did you mentioned class. Were you thinking of class um, as yeah. like separate category? Yeah, I mean, it's the same problem again, which is that the demographic that we're looking at um, tends to be fairly uniform in terms of class. Um, and we have a few working class students, but not that many. Um, one thing that did come up um, with a couple of the answers was um, neurodivergence, which I know, I know is different from both of those categories, but it was still sort of interesting. There was one person who in the discursive section said that they were autistic and um, they find being visible in person. They didn't quite put it like this. Um, they, um, they said they really liked online lectures and se uh, seminars because they could keep their camera off all the time. And then they knew that other people were not um, judging them for the way that they looked or the way that they sounded because they only ever inter interacted with the class using the, um, the, the chat function which is really annoying for me as a teacher. <laughs> but um, it was interesting um, to, I, I just thought that was interesting. But I, um, that was one person who said that. So there's, there's just not enough data in our little pilot study that we've done so far to really comment on any of these, unfortunately. Okay, thank you for your question. I hope that you can enlarge, you know, uh, the people uh, to experiment, experiment with. So I, I have a, another question for um, uh, Carmelo. Well, um, I, I'd like to, you know, my approach to uh, experimental phenomenology is different from yours. It's not the Husserian one, but I come from Merleau-Ponty's theory. So um, I'm not sure to, uh, to have understood, understood why body movements are not relevant. So 
don't you think that uh, when uh, a person moves, the visual field also is uh, restructured? And what happens if, if during a movement, other sensorial domains are involved? Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, that gave me, that gives me the possibility to make this point uh, clearer. Um, I claim that um, um, the sensory motor contingencies um, and the sensation of movements are not part of the visual experience because uh, um, movement matters, but movement matters insofar as um, movements change, do, uh, bring about a change of appearances, of the order of appearances. These changes uh, qualitatively characterized, but um, it's the transformation that appearances uh, undergo um, on the field, which is a structured field, because the positions in the field are can be distinguished uh, from one another uh, because they are filled by differently qualitative content. And uh, it's uh, such transformations of appearances and the order of appearances onto itself that counts from, uh, um, um, from a strict uh, um, visual standpoint. That does not mean that movement is not necessary, but uh, movement uh, is a boundary condition if you so we, we, we may say is a boundary condition um, that bring about transformation of the order of appearances. Uh, this is uh, um, this may be a disputable point uh, if you um, read phenomenology um, from Merleau Ponty's uh, uh, standpoint or from uh, uh, Brentano, Husserl, or Stumpf standpoint. But um, this difference uh, uh, is what I tried to capture uh, with, uh, by talking about uh, uh, an intri the intrinsic properties and connection of appearances. Um, it is true to experience of that uh, visual experience and appearances and visual appearances are connected, need to be connected with that, with other uh, sensory modality. But uh, if we consider movement uh, an intrinsic part of the meaning and the construction of appearances, we may fail uh, to understand what the order of tactile appearances is. Cats, uh, uh, as shown, that uh, um, the modes of touch have different kind of appearing um, in connection to surfaces, uh, volumes, uh, um, overlapping uh, objects, uh, um, and uh, this this mode of uh, these modes of appearing uh, for touch depends on the the intrinsic order of the appearances. It is true that even in this case, movement is fundamental, but movement is not uh, one of the intrinsic property of appearances. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You were uh, extremely clear. Now there is another question in Italian, but I will translate it in English. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's from Walter Fasan. 
Good afternoon. I would like to uh, pose a question, if it's possible. Um, are there any experiments on uh, phenomenology through uh, neuroimaging? Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I, um, as far as I know, uh, there is a researcher, Lutz, uh, who has tried to, um, to use neuroimaging uh, as a tool to uh, investigate uh, uh, what things look like to some to, to the subjects. Uh, so hence to, uh, to capture the subjective experience of seeing something. Um, the, the stimuli uh, were, um, were designed as uh, uh, dots uh, out of stereograms. And uh, while subjects were perceiving those uh, stereograms, their brain activity was recorded. Um, however, um, in this case, uh, um, the study um, submitted that the phenomenological experience uh, that was captured by neuroimaging uh, was a sort of uh, um, first person data. Um, this is a disputable point, according to me, uh, but that research was very interesting in itself. And uh, if, uh, if you want, uh, I can um, make the reference, uh, write the reference uh, on chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmelo. Uh, if you if you want to write the references to to Walter, please do that. Um, in the meantime, I would like to thank again uh, our two guests, so Comarin and Carmelo. So thank you very much, and uh, have a have a good uh, a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.